My name is Sunil Kumar, and I'm Dean at the University of Chicago's Boot School of Business. It's my distinct privilege to welcome you all to today's program titled Milton Friedman and the Power of Ideas. This centennial celebration honors the contributions of Milton Friedman, AM33, the last, the, sorry, the late Paul Snowden Russell Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus in Economics at the University of Chicago. He would have been 100 on July 31st had he been alive. We are only a four months late for a university that isn't so bad. <laughs> I would like to thank our eminent panelists and speakers today. We have a roster befitting the intellectual colossus we celebrate. Special thanks to Lars Hansen and the leadership of the Becker Friedman Institute for putting this program together. One of the most influential economists of the 20th century, Milton Friedman has been described as a brilliant, fearless scholar, an influential public intellectual, a passionate advocate for personal and economic freedom, and by all accounts, a kind and generous colleague, teacher, and friend. Friedman's continuing influence stems from the power of his ideas, ideas built on the twin pillars of sound economic theory and careful empirical analysis. To me, a, a small but personally meaningful example of the clarity of his ideas and his expository abilities can be seen in a video he made over 30 years ago in which he elegantly highlighted the value of the price system through the seemingly simple example of a pencil. Having seen the video, it's quite hard to see a pencil the same way again. Milton Friedman found an intellectual home when he joined the University of Chicago Economics faculty in 1946. He spent 30 years here and remained closely associated with the university throughout his life. He received every honor an economist could be awarded, including the Clark Medal, given to the best American economist under the age of 40, and the, Na the National Medal of Science, and of course the Nobel Prize in 1976. It's the Becker Friedman Institute that gathers us here today to celebrate this centennial, the centennial of Milton Friedman's birth and the enduring power of his ideas. Building on the longstanding University of Chicago tradition of refining ideas through vigorous discussion and debate, the Institute organizes opportunities for scholars to connect and share their work through conferences, lectures, and workshops. Needless to say, it's entirely befitting that this celebration be hosted by the BFI. Once again, we're thrilled to have you here. I'm confident that you'll find this afternoon enriching. I cannot, of course, end without at least one quote from Milton Friedman. One of the great mistakes he said is to judge policies and programs by their intentions rather than their results. I'm certain that when you judge today's activities, from here on out, you will not find them lacking. <laughs> With that, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce you to the moderator of our first panel, a distinguished mathematical economist with a long history at Chicago, Jose Schenkman. Jose is the Theodore A. Wells 1929 Professor of Economics at Princeton University, where he has been since 1999. He spent most of his career at the University of Chicago, where he was the Alvin H. Baum Distinguished Service Professor and Chairman of the Department of Economics. Jose works on economic theory, finance, urban economics, and the economics of social interactions. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the Econometric Society, and received an honorary doctorate from the University of Paris Dauphine. In 2007, he was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. He has served as the Blaise Pascal Research Professor uh, in France, visiting professor at the College de France, vice president in the financial strategies group of Goldman Sachs and Company, co and co-editor of the Journal of Political Economy. In 2002, he was a co-organizer of the document Agenda Perdida 
which contained proposals for reforms in Brazil's economic and social policies. We are very fortunate to have Jose with us today to moderate our first discussion on public policy and the role of government. Please join me in welcoming Jose. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Good afternoon. I also wish to thank the Becker Friedman Institute and Lars Hansen, the Institute's research director, for organizing this event to honor Milton Friedman's centennial and for giving me the honor of chairing this panel. I arrived at the University of Chicago as an assistant professor in 1973. And one of the best learning experiences for young economists was to sit through the lunches at the Quad Club where Milton Friedman, George Stigler, Ted Schultz, Gary Becker, Bob Lucas, and other senior members of the faculty were constantly arguing economics. If you had enough courage, and Ed would know about that, you could enter the discussion, but you should be aware that you would get no excuse for youth. <laughs> I learned a lot of economics in these lunches, but more importantly, I learned that you could use rigorous theoretical and empirical approaches to discuss important applied problems in social science without the plural uh, as in the Chicago tradition. I suspect we'll have a, <clears throat> a similar experience today. We have a panel with three scholars that represent the best of another generation of Chicago economists. I introduce all three of them before they start speaking. Ed Lazier is the Morris Arnold and Nona Jean Cox Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and succeeded Ben Bernanke as Chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors in February 2006. He's also on the faculty of the Stanford University Graduate School of Business and Chairman of the Becker Friedman Institute Board of Overseers. Eddie and I had adjoining offices in the department in 74-75 with no sound isolation. So we know many of each other's secrets, albeit from 40 years ago. I was not called by the Secret Service when he <laughs> joined the Council of Economic Advisors, fortunately for him. Uh, Jim Hackman is a Nobel laureate in the year 2000, and here he shows distinguished service professor of economics at the University of Chicago. Jim directs the Economics Research Center and the Center for Social Program Evaluation at the Harris School of Public Policy, and is also a professor of law at the University of Chicago's Law School. In addition, he's a professor of science and society at University College Dublin and a senior research fellow at the American Bar Foundation. His work has been devoted to the development of scientific, or a scientific basis for economic policy evaluation, with special emphasis on the models of individuals and disaggregated groups, and to the problems and possibilities created by heterogeneity, diversity, and observed contrafactual states. Jim is an old friend, a companion of many late nights work in the social science building, and a co-author. And finally, all the way to the left, I don't think you'd like that position. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you are, Kevin. It's a strange position to be in. It's a strange in. position for me. Kevin Murphy is the George Stigler Distinguished Service Professor in Economics at the University of Chicago and has the distinction of being the first professor at the business school was chosen as a MacArthur Fellow, also known as the Genius Award. Kevin studied the empirical analysis of inequality, unemployment, and relative wages, as well as the economics of growth and development and economics of the value of improvements on health and longevity. Kevin is also an old friend and co-author. Um, each of you are gonna have 10 minutes for initial presentation, followed by maybe something like three or four minutes of discussion by the panel. After the three presentations, we'll have time for questions from the audience. So Eddie, you go first. Thank you. Thanks very much. I, I wasn't actually going to start with a story, but after uh, Jose reminded me of those lunches at the Quad Club, uh, I have to tell you that the first thing that Milton ever said to me, and, and when he was alluding to, I, I remember this, uh, I can't really say I remember it fondly, but I surely remember it. Um, what happened was uh, there was a conversation going on. It was probably my first or second lunch at the Quad Club, and I, uh, you know, ambitiously uh, made a comment, and Milton looked at me and said, that's not the kind of comment an economist would make. <laughs> <laughs> And he was right. So <laughs> hopefully I've uh, learned something since then. We'll see. Uh, anyway, uh, I'd like to talk to you today about the, uh, the size of government and the role of government. Uh, 
Obviously, Milton had very strong views on that. One of the main themes uh, of his work and his, his policy work in particular was that the market was better than government at handling most aspects of the economy. As such, he favored a limited role of government. Mar uh, Milton was not an anarchist. He didn't believe in no government, but he believed in limited government. Uh, certainly thought government was important to ensure the rule of law, certain functions that had to be done at the national level, national defense, and, and some financial structure. But he was always fearful that government would grow to take on tasks for which it was not well suited. Uh, thus, his view was that in order to have a well-functioning government, it was important to make sure that government was kept small which meant limited expenditures, and in order to have limited expenditures, limited tax revenue, and the two were connected. Uh, so I'll just put up a quote uh, that I got off of uh, a talk that Milton gave. It's uh, easy to get this on, on YouTube. Uh, and it's a famous quote. I'm in favor of cutting taxes under any circumstances and for any excuse for any reason whenever it is possible. Uh, and uh, that, that's uh, not because Milton didn't believe that people should be paying their fair share, but he thought that there was a natural tendency for government to grow and that one of the primary ways to keep government in check was to make sure that it didn't have sufficient revenue to grow out of control. Well, so let's look at that empirically. Uh, so here's a, uh, a chart that gives you the relationship between taxes and spending over time. And there are two lines here. One is the long-run average, long-run here being 30-year, long-run average of tax revenues to government. And that line, that orange line, is at 18.3%. And the red line is the long-run, again, 30-year average of expenditures to government. So that's, out, that's the size of the government outlays uh, relative to GDP. And that's at 20.8%. And what that means is that over the past 30 years, we've run a chronic deficit of about 2.5%. Now, that sounds terrible, but it turns out that that's not so bad in the sense that at least if you're running a deficit of 2.5%, the debt-to-GDP ratio is staying about constant. So uh, in that sense, um, uh, that's not something that, that is uh, you know, enormously problematic, but it's certainly something to consider. And governments do run deficits for prolonged periods of time. What is more problematic, and I think the thing that would make Milton very nervous is as he looks out to the future, uh, if you look at these numbers, and by the way, these are the president's numbers. They come from uh, Office of Management and Budget. Uh, if you look at the projections, what you'll see is that we are moving up in the direction of 28% uh, of GDP. Now, what that means, of course, is that if we kept the historic ratio of taxes to GDP constant at 18.3 percent, we would have to we would be running a deficit of somewhere about 10 percent, 9 to 10 percent, depending on the on the year that you look at. Uh, that's too big a deficit. Obviously, that's not not something that's sustainable over the long run. So, what's the solution? Well, um, the solution is to either cut spending or to grow uh, revenues. Uh, one of the th primary ways that people look at these numbers uh, in terms of growing revenues is to think about something like a VAT, a value-added tax. We don't have a value-added tax. We're one of the few economies in the world that doesn't, uh, developing economies, developed common economies in the world that doesn't. Uh, and it's something that Milton actually testified on uh, in front of a commission on which I served in 2005. And Milton was very much afraid of a value-added tax. And his reason was not that a value-added tax was a bad tax. In fact, it's a very efficient tax. Most economists favor the VAT as one of the more efficient taxes because it tends to be a consumption-oriented tax. But Milton's concern was that this would be uh, a way that the government would be able to generate large sources of revenue and be able to grow uh, well beyond where he thought was appropriate. So he was a, a strong opponent of the VAT. Uh, recently, we've heard a, a number of people, the president uh, in particular, has mentioned the VAT as a possibility, uh, and that would be a natural direction for the country to grow. I think that would, would make Milton uh, quite nervous. Well, how, how does the government grow? Uh, well, the government's expanded its role over time, uh, and it's done that in a number of ways. Uh, the first way is through social programs. The main one, as we look into the future, is health. We've all uh, been bombarded by that over the past couple of years. The expansion of Medicare, the expansion of Medicaid, the Affordable Care Act, all of which mean increases in the size of government on the health side. Uh, 
uh, on welfare, uh, TANF, TANF is Temporary Assistance from Needy Families, that uh, is the program that re replaced old style federal welfare. Uh, recently extended unemployment and subsidy for housing through uh, Federal Reserve and through other mechanisms. The second panel, I'm sure, will uh, be discussing those issues. Uh, and then finally, Social Security. Now, Social Security is a system that has grown uh, in large part because of demogra demographics, but also because simply a result of the indexation formula. The formula that Social Security is based on is indexed to wages. The uh, primary, primary insurance and annuity is indexed to wages rather than prices, and that tends to grow, uh, cause it to grow over time. In addition to that, there's another feature that indexes, uh, that there was a one-time indexation for the so-called notch babies that, that raised that, and that has actually caused some pretty significant issues for Social Security, but that's the minor problem. The serious problem is on the healthcare side as we look forward, uh, and most of what you see in that first chart with the growth of expenditures comes from that. How about uh, government intervention in the markets? Well, you know, Milton had strong views on this. He was not a big proponent of industrial policy, uh, certainly would not be an advocate of the government going in and picking certain industries, as we've seen um, happen, you know, throughout the years, but more recently uh, uh, with respect to green jobs and so forth. He would not have, have been in favor of that. Uh, bailouts were not one of his favorite ways to go, as I'm sure you're, you're well aware, um, although, as Gary pointed out to me, he. He made exceptions in some rare cases. I'll let Gary talk about that this evening. Uh, and then on the regulation front, uh, again, he was not an anarchist. He did not believe in, an in a government without regulation, but he, ve he believed in a government that had cautious regulation. Uh, probably would not have been in favor of Dodd-Frank, Dodd nor would he have been in favor of uh, the NLRB moving in a more activist direction, probably uh, most typified by the Boeing intervention uh, in South Carolina. Um, and the reason that he felt that way was because he felt that, uh, like George Stigler, his, his, uh, one of his closest colleagues, uh, along with Gary Becker, he felt that uh, the problem was that regulation could often do more harm than it did good and was very difficult to control. All right, well, what were the results? The results of this growth in government are slow economic growth, high unemployment, and growing debt. And I'm just going to show you that very quickly. So here's a chart that many of you use. Uh, I've seen my colleague John Taylor use it. I think I saw Bob Lucas use something like this a, a, a few years ago. So I don't claim originality here, but I do claim relevance. Um, the, the chart shows you the growth in GDP in the post-war period. And what you see is the growth, the GDP growth tended to go along at a rate of about 3%, which is the slope of that line, which means that when we had a recession, you'd have a period after that recession where growth would come back at a pretty rapid rate. In the current recession, unfortunately, we are not com coming back to the li that line. In fact, we're diverging. Not only is growth not rapid enough to bring us back to long term, uh, to the long term path, but it's not even coming. It's not even parallel to it. We're actually moving away from it. So what we are seeing are GDP growth rates that are declining over time. The green line is the 30. The green bar is the 30 year average. The blue is the 2001 recovery, and the red is the 2009 recovery. Uh, and so we are moving in the wrong direction, and I'm sure that would be something that would not only make Milton nervous, but he would argue that was a result uh, in large part of government uh, actions. What's also true is our unemployment rates have uh, gone up and gone up dramatically. Historically, the United States had lower unemployment rates than Europe. Uh, in the past few years, we've actually seen the United States have higher unemployment rates than Europe. So uh, you see the blue line there. Typically, we were in the range of 5% uh, or so, 5.5% uh, would be uh, something like a normal rate of unemployment. We were down to, at one point, as low as 4. In 2007, the rate was 4.4%. Uh, the rate reached 10% and has been hovering uh, well above the 8% level for a uh, considerable period of time now, and the issue is uh, whether this is a long-term trend or not. Finally, uh, the debt-to-GDP ratio to which I referred earlier has been growing not only for the United States, for all countries, but I'll show you a chart in a minute that, that will uh, make our situation a, a little bit uh, scarier than some of the others. Uh, the United States debt to GDP ratio at the end of this year will be about 70%. I'm, I'm using what we call the public debt rather than the national debt. The public debt is the debt held by the public, not the stuff that's uh, all tr 
treasury bills outstanding because some of those are held by the government. But the public debt's bad enough, uh, and it's rising at a rate of, you know, eight, nine, ten percentage points per year. And the reason for that is that our deficit uh, has been very high. And if you look at this as compared with other countries, uh, we're, we're kind of at the top of the list there. So um, uh, that's not an honor that you want to have. Uh, and uh, uh, so again, I think if Milton looked at these numbers right now, he would be concerned. Uh, I have about one minute left, and uh, so what I'm just going to say is, is that in knowing Milton over, I've known him my whole career. Uh, when I came to Chicago as an assistant professor, he was here, and then he was my colleague at uh, the Hoover Institution for the rest of his life, and uh, uh, I've known him throughout that period. And one thing I knew about Milton is that he was always an optimist, and uh, although he was very quick to point out what people were doing wrong, including his colleagues, uh, he would, he, I think, fundamentally believed that in the long run things would work out, and I think that's primarily because he believed in the effectiveness of the market to discipline government. Uh, we'll see if that happens. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ed, for this um, excellent presentation. Um, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes, uh, uh, if other panels members of the panel want to intervene, but let me start the ball rolling with a question. Um, after Bear Stearns, the Lehman bankruptcy and the bailout of counterparties to AIG, markets seem to believe even more than in 2008 that no large institution will ever be allowed to fail. Of course, Friedman's always emphasized the importance of getting incentive rights, and incentives are not right right now and haven't been for a while. If we were to get rid of the excesses of Dodd-Frank, we need either a credible commitment to no bailout or something else. Now, I do not think that after 2008, 2009, governments are in position of delivering a credible commitment of no bailout. So what do you think we should do to replace Dodd-Frank? How would you start that? Well, I, I, I would say, I would go back to uh, Milton's view of regulation that uh, you have to worry about it doing more harm than good, and in particular, if you think about the industries that uh, caused the crisis, um, uh, let, let, me, let me just go back a minute here. So back in 2007, we had something uh, in, in, at the White House called the, the President's Working Group on Financial Markets. And what we would do is we would have these meetings, which until the financial crisis actually were very boring. Uh, but once the financial crisis came, they kind of became fun. Uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, we were, what we would try to do is we would try to figure out where the potential of systemic risk was, uh, was most present. And we were looking at things like, uh, like hedge funds and some of the other parts of the economy that were the least regulated. And of course, what ended up happening was the parts that really hit us were the banks, which are highly regulated, and an insurance company, AIG, which is also highly regulated. So, so the point was that obviously they were regulated, but they weren't regulated in the right way. Now, you can always say that after the fact. It's easy to say, you know, well, they weren't regulated in the right way, but what's the right way? And I guess my fear is that when I look at Dodd-Frank and I say, if we had Dodd-Frank, you know, in 2006 or 2005, would that have prevented the current crisis? My sense is that it would not have prevented the current crisis. It would not have prevented the uh, leverage kind of buildup that we saw. It would not have prevented the kind of off-balance sheet stuff that we saw. It would have pushed stuff into, the, into other sectors, and I, I don't think it would have been particularly effective. So I'm evading your question in the sense that I'm not really giving you an answer to what we can do, but, mm -hmm. I, but I think that, uh, that the point of this is that you know, you have to do the best you can. You have to watch these markets as well as you can, but you can't believe that the government is going to be the final solution to this problem. Uh, if the markets are not sufficiently able to dis discipline themselves, at least in part, in the, in the context of the regulation that you have, you're going to have problems every so often, and I don't think there's a way to avoid it. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? So we'll pass to, to Jim's presentation. Okay, so I'm very, uh, very honored to be here to speak, and I want to make some remarks which are going to change gears a little bit, in fact, substantially. What I really want to talk about is something that I think is misunderstood and I think is an extremely important part of Milton's, Milton Friedman's uh, success and influence, and that is the, uh, the power of his me empirical methodology. Uh, now, we can gauge 
Friedman's influence or anybody's influence, at least any academic's influence, in two different ways. Usually we talk about awards and, and citations and so forth, and that's what the dean just said, and I think Friedman would certainly stand up by that measure. But there's another, I think more important measure to the influence of a person, and that's the influence of the ideas in the wider world and his contributions to understanding and improving society. Now the two measures don't always agree, but for Friedman they do. And so the question I want to raise today is why have his ideas persisted and why do they still inform current discussions of economic and social policy? Now anybody who knew him would certainly agree that he was clever and highly creative. Uh, he had interesting things to say about a wide range of issues. A, a brilliant example is something just posted on the University of Chicago website. I don't know if people saw it. It was his discussion on why Jews who had benefited from capitalism often supported anti-market movements. I mean, this was something that, that was just a very clever and insightful essay. And I urge you to download it and take a look at it yourself. But I think the key theme was not just that he was clever, although he's certainly clever and highly creative. Friedman was an economic scientist, and he thought of himself that way, and even defined what the concept meant for him, and I want to share that with you today. What he did is he merged theory and evidence in his work, and he demanded that of himself and that of others. He also asked really big questions, and, he, and, and the questions that were of major importance. And I contend that it was this methodology, his respect for facts, and his cultivation of these facts, and his willingness to in, in consider a range of evidence and encouragement of hard empirical work, and his ability also to distill these facts in a crystalline way that explains really his lasting success and the enduring nature of his work. So I'm, gonna, I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to put up any figures, said atypically, but what I am going to do is uh, put up some quotes from Milton Friedman. And, and I, mostly we're going to think about the methodology of positive <laughs> economics, but I want to go back behind a little bit, okay? and, and I, I want to go back to some precursor ideas, which I think really help explain the, help explain the man. So people are familiar with this quotation. I don't know if I have to read it to you. But the key goal, and it's a recurrent theme in his work, was that the goal of positive science was the development of a theory that would yield valid and meaningful predictions about phenomena. And so for him, he was, certainly wasn't anti-theory. And I think there's nothing that could be read in any of his work, although it's sometimes been interpreted that way. What he was interested in, however, was holding the theory accountable and actually doing a very demanding task, predicting counterfactual phenomena saying, well, if we change this policy, what will happen in the, in the, in the other world? And he, he really thought about both the, the theory and the empirical work. Now, maybe a slightly better example of this, and it's something that's probably not as well known, is an essay that he wrote in 1950, published in the JPE, the Journal of Political Economy. Uh, and you'll notice the title of the lecture, which is deliberately provocative. Uh, Wesley Clare Mitchell as an economic theorist. And for anybody who knows the long history of Burns and Mitchell and the fight between Koopmans and, uh, and, and the and, and the no so-called measurement without theory. One will read this article, as I did. I just recently read it, and I found it very insightful, as really Friedman's response. I couldn't find any other response other than this article by Friedman, but here it is. And he repeats the same notion, but then elaborates what exactly a theory is all about, what, he, what a theory is all about, and what the science is all about, an integrated explanation of observed phenomena, and then looking at data, collecting data and looking at observations and regularizing these and formulating theories. And he made a very important distinction in the same article, which I think is interesting. And it's something that I think really explains him. I, I would like to interpret for you in my remaining five minutes or so that Friedman was really walking a tightrope between two very different influences. And I think the fact that he successfully navigated this throughout his life actually allowed him to, to, to have such great influence. So he quoted from Marshall, the first quotation that's in bold, everybody knows. Uh, the most reckless and treacherous of all theorists is he who professes to let the facts and figures speak for themselves. So he's fully on board that you really do need theory to explain the facts. But then he also pointed out the most reckless and treacherous of all empirical workers, this is Friedman now, is he who formulates theories to explain observations that are products of careless and inaccurate empirical research. So, Again, why do I go on about this aspect of Friedman? Because I think Friedman, he had many, many facets, and he had multiple influence. Frankly, I thought we'd have much more discussion. We could have hours of discussion on each of his ideas. Uh, but I think when you ask him himself what he thought his most important contributions were, he always mentioned his contributions to knowledge, to scholarship. In fact, there's a video I tried to find. I'm sure it's out there. I saw it. But uh, it was an interview asking Milton Friedman, 
what do you regard as your most important contribution? And it was with Rose Friedman. And she interjected, your contributions to uh, promoting liberty and human freedom, he said. And he said, no, Rose, that's not true. It's my contribution to lasting scholarship and to economic science. So I think he really was. This, this was the nature of Friedman's work, long-term projects. Now, the, the two projects that won the Nobel Prize and probably have received the greatest attention, justly so, I think, are the monetary history of the United States, a project that actually started in 1948 and was only finished in the last volume in 1982. So we're talking about uh, an enormously long uh, span uh, where he worked on this. And of course, the consumption function, of which Bob uh, Lucas will say uh, uh, quite a bit more. But in each of these projects, he collected new data, created new theoretical frameworks, worked with existing researchers, tackled important policy problems. In the case of the monetary uh, policy, uh, certainly the, trying to bring back the importance of money into, a into economic analysis where it really dropped off the map in many quarters. And then in consumption function, looking at the role of fiscal stabilizers and the multipliers as a source of economic development. But in each of these ideas, this was his credo. He said this repeatedly. I can give you many examples of this, that he would always say that hallmark of good research was that you actually should understand, quote, your opponent. He was a debater at heart. Uh, but you should understand your opponent better uh, and uh, his own views uh, than your opponents do. And so you really, really go through into a, to a deep analysis. So what were the ingredients of his success? I, I have to be very short here, although I'll try not to be <laughs> if I can get away with it. But I, I have some <laughs> quotes. So I think there were three ingredients to the methodology. What's that? I know, but, I, but Kevin gave me a little of his time. And I'm sure that <laughs> he did, actually. He can testify. So what are the ingredients of his success? First of all, he used economic theory to learn from and interpret the data. And I really want to say both learning from data and revising the theory in the light of data. He really emphasized this cumulative process of knowledge. It's very hard to teach this. And in some ways, you can say, is it academically successful? Is what's taught in the econometrics textbooks today? The answer would probably be no. But in fact, it was really something that was really vital. Updating knowledge, hypothesis, confirmation, and if rejection, formulating a new hypothesis. And he was very emphatic. And here I'm just quoting from the, um, the, the methodology. I noticed I dropped the, the citations. But basically, the methodology of positive economics, he talks about these two different stages. But he really doesn't like the distinction between sort of creating an hypothesis and testing it. Because for him, it was an inductive process. He was, going, he was doing this cycle of knowledge. And I think that's the important thing. And for him, he just really rejected what a lot of econometricians would talk about. Uh, certainly what I was trained to think about, which was the identification problem, which of course was formulated in a clear way here, just a couple of doors down from his own office at the University of Chicago, where you define a model and isolate which models are consistent with the data. He thought that was an artificial process. And I think it's correct to say, and it's been, it's been discussed frequently, that the structure of, 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 of data knowledge was, is to actually, to, to not to, 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 how do you learn from just that hypothesis procedure? And so that was one key ingredient of his, of his success. The second ingredient of his success, I think, and this is, I think, something easily misunderstood, is that he really was a Marshallian economist. I mean, I think in virtually all of his work, he wrote a famous paper on the Marshallian demand curve. But I think it's important, and I think some of his work has been misinterpreted uh, to be a little bit, uh, taken a little bit out of context. So for example, he had this quotation. He was responding to a quote by Tobin on his work, a, a symposium that actually Bob Gordon, who's here, organized, published in the JPE. But he, he responded to some of Tobin's criticism, and he talked about Marshallian theory, of which he had written a lot, as an engine for the discovery of concrete truths. He really wanted the notion of Ceteris Paribus. And then in response to Tobin, who basically criticized him for not having a fully articulated general equilibrium model, uh, he basically, and this is his word again, from our Valrasian approach, abstractness, generality, and mathematical elegance have become ends in themselves, criteria to which to judge economic theory. Now, this quotation is sometimes taken to say he was against general equilibrium theory. I don't think he was. I think what he was in favor of, he was, just didn't want to stop there. He didn't want it to say, this is the end in itself. He asked that it have economic content. So he didn't say uh, you should judge. So just as he said he didn't want to judge the theory by its realism, he also didn't want to judge it solely by its elegance. And he kept insisting for himself and for others uh, that, 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 it be, uh, that there be consequences. And so this is another example from, the, from an article. 
that actually is a precursor to the methodology of positive economics. And it really says what I just said, that basically the idea for descriptive realism is, um, uh, is, uh, is, is, too, is too much. Theorizing has to condense. We have to boil. He said that as well. But he also said we didn't want to essentially just escape into abstractions. He really asked for empirical content. So I think that's the sense in which I think you can interpret this. Now, Friedman himself was hardly afraid of mathematics. He was a contributor. He wrote some famous papers in statistics as a, as a graduate student. Uh, he had a choice in going to Brown Applied Math or Chicago Economics. He came here, but he was definitely a very strong uh, person. He was not afraid of formal methods, nor did he oppose them. But I'll, I will conclude if I have a minute. Uh, just another minute? OK, great. He's, I'll keep eating into his time. I'm sure he has much to say. But I owe this to Steve Stigler. Steve Stigler gave me a letter a few years ago uh, that it was an exchange between Friedman, the young Friedman, 1946, and E.B. Wilson, who was a famous, I think the only way to describe him is a polymath, a person with great, who is, who is, who, who is famous for many things and is forgotten now. <laughs> but that's another story. Uh, uh, but it was a letter. And so Friedman had written an essay on Oscar Lange's book, Price Flexibility and Employment. And Friedman really took Lange to task, not with a theory. He said the theory was fine. But he really insisted that there were huge errors in interpreting the data and its casual empiricism. And so Friedman, uh, uh, Wilson in his letter basically was saying, well, the Lange paper book was good. For some reason, he had read the book. And he also read Friedman's review. And he said, you know, cleverness is highly admired. But then he said, look, your, your article, your review is very negative. Can you come up with some positive contributions of economic science? And I'm going to show you what his five, his top five were. Remember, this is 1946. And I think this I find extremely interesting, so I have to share it with you. These are his top five articles. He didn't say, he wasn't limited to five. These are the top five articles. Wesley Claire Mitchell's Business Cycle book. Wesley Claire Mitchell, by the way, was a Chicago graduate. Uh, uh, Burns and Mitchell. The very same Burns and Mitchell it was the subject of so much controversy about measurement without theory. On a book, which is very odd, really, Arthur Burns' Production Trends in the United States, but it's not odd at all because Friedman was an uh, undergraduate at Rutgers when Burns was finishing the book. And I couldn't resist. I checked the book out. And Friedman's thanked. Remember, he's only an undergraduate by Arthur Burns, who, by the way, was a student of Mitchell, Viner's book and Clark's book. So, he also adds one other paper in a kind of tentative way and says, I think there's one other thing that might have real economic science. Now, by this, he meant adding you know, theory to empirical work. And that's the famous book, Income from Independent Professional Practice, which, as Gary will fully attest, is written about in Human Capital, was a very important precursor to human capital. What's interesting is what he didn't put on. He didn't put on Frank Knight. He explicitly says, even though he was a very big fan of Frank Knight, he rejected the book, Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit. He said, it's a very good book. It's very important. But the empirical observations are casual and unordered. That was his, those were his words. And then closer to home, since I'm the Henry Schultz professor, he also talked specifically about Henry Schultz. So Henry Schultz, as some people will say, was the model of economic science. You can read for yourself what he says about Henry Schultz. He says, well, uh, you know, he didn't like Henry. He thought Schultz was good. He was careful and meticulous. But what was missing in Schultz was his inability to learn from the data. Once he got a rejection, what to do next? And he said, and the last quote is, he always tried to wrench the data into a pre-existing theoretical scheme, no matter how much of a wrench was required. <laughs> and uh, that, for him, was anathema. So let me just, if I, if I have a minute, I can stop now. <laughs> I, I give you, give me a minute and I'll take five, but I will just, let me just uh, give you what I think. I think Friedman helped create the Chicago School. So let me just, let me just end with this and, and end with a couple of quotes. And, and uh, uh, so he, when he talks about what was the difference between Chicago, he's now comparing Chicago and Harvard. This is in a private interview, a letter to, uh, to an economic historian um, and, and uh, writing about uh, his influence. And see, what was the real distinction? It wasn't price theory. It wasn't the emphasis in price theory, per se. It was basically treating economics as a serious subject versus treating it solely as a branch of mathematics. So, uh, so basically, then he contrasts Harvard and, and Chicago at that time. But it's the issue, again, of real problems and applying real theory. So I think, actually, that's a good summary of what I think is the essence of Friedman. And I think it was the fact 
And by the way, I think it's a legacy that's very hard to follow. <laughs> Anybody who tries this massive kind of empirical discourse really finds it very challenging. Don't forget, it took him close to 34 years to finally finish the project on money and the economy. The consumption function book goes back uh, seven, eight years. And so it was basically not just something out in 30 minutes or a month. It was actually something where he learned, he failed, he synthesized across the body of data. And I think that's what gave power to the ideas. Everything was rooted in data, at least this body of work rooted in data, and rooted in kind of learning from the data. And I think that's a very distinctive uh, contribution of Friedman. So thank you very much. I, I wanted to talk about what we can learn from Friedman. And, and very much like Jim, I took a tack of sort of saying not so much what did he do, not kind of subject-wise what we can learn, but what we can learn from the way he did things. And a lot of it is very similar to what Jim talked about. And first off, I want to say that he took the same approach to everything he did, whether it was teaching, whether it was research, whether it was policy. He was always interested in using economics as a tool for explaining the world around him. And he thought economics was a powerful tool for learning what was there and for understanding the world around him. And he pushed his students, he pushed himself, he pushed others. To, to understand the world and use economics as, as a tool and not just as a game or anything else. It was always a focus on explaining things around him. And that was important because it allowed him to get more feedback on his ideas. Because if you're using the same thing everywhere, you get feedback in multiple dimensions. Is this useful for people looking at the world? Is it useful to my students? Is it useful? in the profession and people pick up on what I do. I, I like to tell a little story along those lines, and this is related to what Jim talked about at the end. When, when I was on the job market, I, I, went, to, uh, I went, went to Cambridge and, and I, ha I had lunch with Paul Samuelson, and it was 1983, I think, and we were in a recession, and he asked me, well, what does Bob Lucas think the government ought to do and I was a damn graduate student, so I'm sitting there and I say, like, well, you know, I think he would say it depends on what people's expectations are and all these other things. He said, well, I know that's what he writes in his papers, but what does he really think? <laughs> and that was like a shock. I said, it's not the world I knew. I didn't know a world where people said one thing and thought one thing and wrote something else. So I don't think Milton Friedman would ever ask that question. I just, he would have taken the same approach for policy that he took for writing papers. And I think that's an important lesson for us today. I think too many people have gone back to ideas that they had abandoned academically years ago because they're just, have abandoned kind of thinking. They've, they've lost faith in economics. And, and, and Friedman had what I would call well-placed confidence. He had confidence in economics. And he had confidence in economics because he used it over and over again. He used it for everything he did. Whether he was writing a Newsweek article, whether he was talking about policy, whether he was teaching first year PhD students, whatever it was he was doing, he used the same tools and the same approach. And the fact that he saw repeat, and he kept looking at the world and said, can I explain this? Can I explain that? Can I explain why firms do this? Can I explain why government does that? Think about Eddie's example. Eddie gave the example of the VAT. Friedman, had a different answer because he asked a different question. But it was the same question he always asked. He said, look, I know the VAT's an efficient tax, but what incentive does that give government? He asked the incentive question that economists always asked, but in a context where economists typically forget to ask it. And that's the mistake that Friedman seldom made. He, he, he had his little, he had a few things to do. He had a few things he understood, and he used them to the utmost. I want to go on and talk a little bit about the optimal size of your toolbox. And this is what I think Jim allowed him to do what you were talking about, which is another point I want to make, which is going back and forth to the data. His world was not build a theory, test it. And when you gave that first example where he's talked about predicting things, I thought you were going to contradict me. Thank God you came back to the other part. Because I think that was a very key part of Friedman. 
the theory and the data was a cycle. You went, you, you went to the data, you went back to the theory, you went to the data, it was built together. You look at his stuff on any area he worked in, it was back and forth to the theory. The danger in doing that is if you have too big a toolbox, if every time you hit the data, you have a large box to pick explanations from, you're gonna get yourself in trouble real fast. And it was the same limited toolbox that he had tested over and over in the classroom and on many other problems that allowed him to be successful with that kind of non-classical statistical approach to empirical work, I think, is the idea was he wasn't gonna grab the craziest explanation. And that's one of the problems we have today in economics. We have too damn big a toolbox. We just constantly see something that doesn't fit the theory. Well, we got another theory that we can throw in there to, to, to fill it in. And I think that's a big problem. And that's a, that was one of my, part of what made Friedman so successful is that he limited the size of his toolbox. But he didn't ignore the data. He looked at the data, and then he worked hard to say, how can I fit that into the principles that I know, that past experience have told me work in, in this place? I want to talk a little bit about how do you influence policy. Because Friedman's had an enormous influence on policy in my mind. I assume people on the next panel are going to talk about some of his in influences. I know Mr. Taylor is going to talk about, I think of Friedman having a huge influence. Maybe Friedman didn't get it right and you fixed it in terms of how to, how to do policy. But I, I, I think, why did he have such an influence? Well, because when he approached policy, he didn't divorce it from economics. So much of his focus on policy was built through his research. And when you build it through research, you create a platform on which other people can build. When you're just down in Washington telling people what to do, that doesn't do nearly as much to build a platform. And in the long run, you're going to have a much more influence on policy, I think, if you do it in conjunction with research. So you have to abide by what Jim says. You have to work on problems that have applicability, of, that ha can explain the world. You have to go back and forth with the world to make sure you're in touch with the world and not doing something that's out of touch. But you do it within the research realm. And so when people talk about, well, what's really policy research? You can't say it's just things that are immediately applicable. Because the most important thing is getting the profession moving in the direction they need to and priming the pump in some sense to have long-lasting influence on policy. And finally, I'll just say what makes Milton great is he's passed the market test. He really has. If you look at who he's influenced, he's influenced people not only at Chicago, he's influenced around the country. His so-called opponents have been in, influenced by him as well. And it was, that, it was those pieces. It was the constant focus on applying economics, the confidence that economics could explain the world around him to answer policy questions, to answer just questions about why we see things the way they are. It was limiting the size of his toolbox so that he didn't overfit when he went through that important process of back and forth <coughs> between theory and data. It was then putting that through multiple directions in terms of both within the academic community as well as in public policy. And the striking thing about Friedman to me is when I see him on Free to Choose or I read him in Newsweek or I read a paper of his or I read a book, it's the same guy. It's the same guy talking the same language, maybe less technical some places than others, but it's always coming from the same place and it's always that interplay of theory and data and it's always a long-lasting belief in economics. And I think that's what Milton, made Milton such a great man and the reason we're honoring him today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin, for, I, I actually believe that you and, and um, Jim um, talked about very complimentary things about Milton's contribution, and in fact, explain why places like this are important, why places like the Becker Friedman Institute are important, because those are the places where you're gonna generate ideas that eventually are gonna influence policy, but they're not, um, they're not places where you, politicians should come and ask questions. It's a place where you have to generate the ideas that eventually are going to inform policy, policy. We have a few minutes for questions from the audience. That's why I said start audience Q&A. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I should start audience Q&A. Uh, you should wait for the microphone because I think we're recording this, right? And so even if you shout, it's not going to be efficient enough. Yeah. 
Uh, this is a question for Eddie. I'm Bob Gordon. Um, we had an experience between 2001 and 2007 that in a way is a test of Milton's idea that you have to starve the beast. Uh, we had tax cuts in 2001 and again in 2003, uh, and yet this did not prevent the Bush administration from fighting two wars that were unfinanced and reforming medical care prescription drug coverage without raising taxes. So in that, at least one example, uh, it was not enough to cut taxes as a prevention of increase in government's role. You can debate why that was done. You were part of it. I'd be very interested in how you would apply Milton's ideas to that period. Okay. Uh, well, you know, the easy answer is could have been even worse. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I, I think, uh, you know, if you look at the numbers, Bob, uh, during that period, it is true that there was some pretty significant growth in spending. Uh, overall, the spending in, th in that period, even with the war and with Medicare Part D, which is the, the – those are the two major components as you identify them. That's accurate. Um, even with that, the, the ratio of spend to GDP was 19.6 percent throughout that term which was lower than Clinton, Bush, 41, and Reagan. Uh, the, that doesn't mean it couldn't have been better. But I think, uh, the, the, again, I, you know, I, I'm not going to try to defend the, the record of that administration. What I will say is that I think that the evidence in, in the long term is that eventually you have to face some kind of austerity. You either do it while it's happening or you're in a situation like Greece is in right now. And you, you either cut spending or you're going to have to raise taxes. I mean, there's just no way around it. Uh, and it's better to do it as you go along rather than do it in the, at the end. So I, I still think that the evidence is probably supportive of the fact that if you have low taxes, you're less likely to get big government. If you look at the European countries, you know, you're looking at one period in time, but look at the European countries. Look at those countries that adopted VATs, like uh, Germany. They started out at 6 percent, they end up at 19 percent. You know, that's not the formula that uh, I think we want to get into. And I think that's the problem that Milton was most concerned about. So when Kevin said, you know, you, he applied everything and he thought about what would be the incentives in government, I think he was looking at other countries and what their experience had been with, uh, with things like the VAT and uh, what happens when you do allow that. Because again, you know, I mean, if you, you know the data better than I do. If you look at the spending for uh, European countries versus the spending for the U.S., it's, it's still pretty, pretty significantly different. Question here. Yes. Uh, an important part of Milton's toolbox was MV equals PY. Uh, in the light of that, how would you explain the collapse in velocity after the Lehman crisis, and what do you think uh, Milton's response to that would have been? I think yeah, that's yeah. a question. I'm really sorry. I, that should be the first question taken by Lars's panel. Lars, you write this down. <laughs> We're on the micro panel. We're on the yeah. micro side. <laughs> We're not really sure what MV is. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do know. We do know, but it's like the micro side. P we understand. <laughs> P we understand. <laughs> P we're good at, yeah. Yeah, question on the, um, the ec economic crisis that we've had, and particularly the financial markets. Without using government regulation at all, how would you change the incentives, whatever incentives didn't work well in the crisis? How would you get them to change? How would you induce them to change? Assuming there's some incentives that were bad that didn't work, but without without talking about government regulation causing those or doing those, take the government regulation piece out, a market alternative with different incentives as right. opposed to the regulatory approach we've had. Well, I, I, I don't know. You guys may have some different views. I'll, I'll start. I, I would say that the market was uh, extremely effective in its discipline, maybe too effective. So if you look at the period, uh, after the crisis, 2008, when I mean the crisis, the, the peak of the crisis, autumn 2008, you look at lending, you look at LIBOR, you look at Fed funds, you look at any indicator of what happened and everything froze up. So the market was pretty good at disciplining additional lending that took place at that point in time. It wasn't the government, it wasn't government regulation that said you guys better not lend anymore. Uh, that was all market forces. Now, you might argue that you know, they weren't optimal, that there might have been a better path, a smoother path. But it certainly wasn't the case that what we saw as a reaction to that 
was induced by government and by government regulation. So, you know, uh, markets don't always get it right, and I don't think Milton would ever argue that markets always get it right. What he would argue is that markets are more likely to get it right than our governments because governments are more susceptible to uh, political forces, capture, the kinds of things that, that George and others have, had pointed out as well. Yeah, I guess I, the only thing I would say is I, I, I don't think you can think about the problems as, as, quote, you got problems and then you got regulation. I mean, regulation was part of the issue to begin with. I mean, in fact, I, I think we really are constantly in fighting this battle of we have a partially regulated world that people optimize against. <laughs> and, you know, given the types of insurance that were available and the bailouts that were available, the kind of behavior we saw, I think Milton would predict would be the kind of things that, that would people would do. People optimizing against the existing regulation seems to me would tend to do those things. And, and it's kind of a shame that, you know, the market forces were there to punish people for having made mistakes. And I think a lot of us wish they'd been punished a little more severely in some ways. But, um, you know, so I, I guess you can't, I don't think you can make this hypothetical exercise of taking regulation out of the system. I just think it's, but there's still the question, right? We live in a world in which ideally we should say, look, government should just let these banks go under, AIG go under, to have let uh, Bear Stearns go under, or the creditors of Bear Stearns mm -hmm. go under. You have, it did leave Lehman, it did let Lehman go, but not AIG or Bear Stearns. So the question is, in a world in which it's impossible to commit to that. It seems to be impossible to commit to that. Is it then better to have some forms of regulation? I think that's the kind of question we're asking here. Yeah. Or just let, because the market cannot by itself solve a problem in which, which is a problem of commitment of the government, of yeah. lack of commitment of the government for Yeah, I guess the, the only issue I would point out is it's, it's hard to see how Dodd-Frank, I mean, Dodd-Frank has so much stuff sure. in it unrelated to the issues and other things. I mean, that's the that's the other problem that Friedman would talk about as well. Is that, you know, you, there might be a very legitimate thing that the government needs to do, but if I give them the ability to do that, why are they going to limit their actions to sure. that? I mean, yeah. in fact, the theory tells us they would do very different than that. But, but I would just make a point that it's not necessarily more regulation or less regulation. I mean, you're you're dealing from a partial. You're dealing from a world that's sort of second best to start with, and so it's not obvious that it was regulation per se. It might have been deregulation that brought on some aspects of the crisis, right, in the way the financial right. market, people yep. responded to it. So you're dealing from a second best world, and then you have to ask sort of, where do you move in that direction? And I frankly don't know what Friedman would have said about the whole cycle going back to the two, 2000 and so forth. Can I take another question, or am I forbidden to do it? <laughs> no, I give you permission. Huh? Yeah, so we take one more question, last one. Jose, it's Mark Brickle. <coughs> Um, I, I might have a, a, a contribution to an answer to what Friedman would have said. Uh, not long after his 90th birthday party here, I had dinner with him in San Francisco. I had been nominated by the Bush administration to serve as the regulator of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And I asked Friedman at the dinner table to tell me what his advice would be to the regulator. What was the best way to regulate these enterprises which had an implied guarantee, implied federal support? And he took the program from his 90th birthday, and he wrote on the cover three words, privatize, privatize, privatize. <laughs> he knew that they, they were being uh, subsidized by the too big to fail doctrine, that the creditors weren't providing market discipline, and that the presence of government policy, the, the regulatory policy, was a, an inhibition to good behavior in the marketplace. Thank you, Mark. Well, now I think Amy really would be upset with me if I don't end our session. I want to thank Ed, Kevin, and Jim in the audience for a wonderful discussion. And we have a, we're going to have a short video tribute to Milton Friedman. After the video, we'll take a short 10-minute break. Is that, are we, do we still have 10 minutes, Amy? Yes, <laughs> promise 10 minutes. And then we'll begin the second panel. Then it's Lars's problem from then on. <laughs>